Welcome to the Beacon House Podcast, recorded live in Knoxville, Tennessee. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very exciting episode of Beacon House. Uh, this is our spring spectacular. Uh, it's been a minute. I think the last time we talked to you guys, it was back like just right after the snow apocalypse and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, spring has sprung. Now it's starting to get a little, uh, it's actually really cold right now. I got, we had a little bit of a, what they call a cold snap, but, uh, right now the, the, you can tell it's approaching spring and then eventually summer and, you know, all those things that go with it, wasps and, you know, whatever. But before we get too far into it, let's say hello to my lovely co-host over there. Grace, did, uh, wait, Grace, hang on a minute. What happened to Grace? Who's, who's this over there? Who's over? Who is this over there? This smells like something we've smelled before. Hi, everybody. It's your friend, Michael. I just want you to dance and have a good time. <laughs> oh, no, guys. I'm, the hyena snicker has returned. I'm so incredibly sorry, everybody. It appears that Grace is not here. That Sitting across from me is former Beacon House... Uh, co-host and founder uh and also the singer of burn the city ironically Ugh. uh hunter barnhart is here right now <laughs> oh thank you everybody um no 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 i haven't grown up i've just been inhaling pollen for a week straight <clears throat> oh boy this is gonna be a rough one be great <laughs> jesus i can, can't wait to edit this one for 49 days um, all that talk of sibilance yeah, yeah. I'll be editing this until the stuff we talk about is no longer relevant. <laughs> Shortest episode ever. Oh my God, Hunter's back. The end. <laughs> well, in all seriousness, Hunter, welcome back. It's good to have you back. And um, we, and this is super, uh, like this is very on brand for you because we're here to talk about something that we kind of cut our teeth on this podcast talking about back when they started to reboot or re-reboot, or I don't know how many boots there have been, but the Godzilla franchise. Re-reboot's a good way to look at it, honestly. Because they rebooted it in the... Well, wait, so hang on. What was the first Godzilla reboot? The 90s? Uh, you're talking about the one with Matthew Broderick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was the first, and then they rebooted again in 2014? 2014. That, but is the 2014 Godzilla movie part of this current lineage? It is. So that's because we talked about this at band practice. That's why I was saying... Um, your, your usage of the word re-reboot is actually good. Um, that movie, King of the Monsters, this is the one that uh, is 2019. Yeah. That one borrows tons. So it doesn't disregard 2014, but 2014 made buku amounts of money and people were still upset with aspects of it. They thought the characters are boring, not enough monster stuff, blah, blah, blah. Too dark, all that stuff. So King of the Monsters is the softest possible reboot of any reboot ever but it kind of is one Got it's it. it's much like think a good analogy is honestly the dark knight trilogy because most people just forget that batman begins is connected to the dark knight because the dark knight was such a moment right and even though king of the monsters wasn't that it was actually the worst performer of the series so far and the way the public consumed it, it, it had all the monsters and all the colors and all the stuff. So it was at least impactful that way. It's similar. People are like, yeah, that one, because that's actually number two. But so they, they've, they certainly got their legs under them now, don't they? Yeah. And you know what? There's a lot <coughs> I'd like to cover. Uh, I, I would like, I would like to get into um, how do those line up with the, also the Japanese movies. I know there was Godzilla minus one that came out recently, which according to you and our genius bandmate, Dylan, uh, who makes everything possible. Dylan. <laughs> by, by the way, just everybody thank Dylan for just all of this. Yes. Um, and uh, also the the Monarch TV series, like how that fits into the whole thing, which I, I tried to get into it, and it, I didn't, it didn't really land with me. But I, but I feel like you're the guy to explain all of the Godzilla mythos and how it all lines up, even if people, whether they love it or hate it, just I think you could pay, possibly uh, guide the listeners on how to stick it all together, like map it all, which goes where. And certainly try to. Okay, okay. But before that, we have a little announcement to make. Speaking of kaiju. That's right. Giant monsters. Speaking of giant <coughs> monsters battling, um, we have, uh, and, and you should be hearing this, just a little under a week before Burn the City plays again in the Knoxville Bandy Band competition. It's weird calling it a competition because music is not a competition. Music is an exhibition and 
you know, we've been saying that for years, but, but, but in this case, whatever, it's fine because it's for such a good cause. Uh, in fact, it's a variety of good causes. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're kind of pushing for the Young Williams Animal Center aspect. Like if you come to see us, you get a vote. And if you buy a drink, you get a vote. If you buy food, I think you get four votes. Yep. There's a ton of way to garnish more votes. And you can, you know, by all means, vote for whoever you want. Yeah, they're all good. Um, and, and, and put your ticket in the, the, you know, the, I think it's the Knoxville Historical Society, not Hard Knox Roller Girls, mm-hmm. and Young Williams Animal Society. Like, mm-hmm. we just, I happen to fall on Young Williams a lot because they've helped me personally uh, with a bunch of rescue animals, and they help people all the time. They work on volunteer uh, donations, and it's just, you know, it's just a great place to put your money, and they really do care and take care of animals, and, you know, anyway, that's kind of what we're pushing for, and we just happen to be playing with another phenomenal lo- like local band um james lee and the rest they are spectacular uh and and uh, in fact i believe they share a member with our our rehearsal hall mates um mm. yeah rough dreams rough dreams uh so i mean like, we're familiar with these guys and like i'm a big fan man i've listened to them a bunch i've watched a ton of videos of them and i think they're just spectacular and honestly I mean, you decide, but I feel like they deserve Evo just as much as we do. And it's just going to be a spectacular night all the way around. Like, there's no, like, we're against them or they're against us. Like, everybody's friends. Like, however it turns out, whatever. Let's just raise a lot of money for the charities. And ple- And also, I guess the big announcement, this is at the new place. I can't wait. Asylum 801. I formerly the International. Formerly the Valerium. Formerly the electric ballroom. Mm -hmm. And before that, it was even called the Orpheus. I mean, it's been a variety of things down through the years, but you know where we're talking about the big building under the bridge, right off 17th street and Dale Avenue, just past the soccer fields. It's going to be a big part of what they're creating to call the Lunaverse, which is going to be a huge outdoor festival, four story. I mean, just a crazy big thing, but this particular show is in the room that used to be, the Valerium and the international after that. So, I have seen so many shows there over the years and made memories. And when, when I started out in music, I had grandiose dreams <laughs> of being able to play the Valerium to like open for somebody or something. One I have day. seen and, so many memories in this building. Like, Oh uh, my God. I don't even remember what the first show I ever saw there was. Uh, but it was electric ballroom when I saw it. And, but I mean, I, I, I remember seeing like 311 and um, no doubt when nobody knew who they were. And like, we hung out with Gwen Stefani out in front of the place and like <clears throat> just all kind. I mean, I've just seen everything there. Like I've seen uh, anthrax there. I've seen three. I just had 311. I mean, I've seen so many bands there. They're just really, really important. Uh, and it's just been a big deal. And they've, they've got it back open now. It's obviously under new ownership but they're moving the band eat band competition there yeah. to my understanding. I'm not saying they won't have any more of them at Scruffy, but it's going to be at Asylum 801, formerly International, formerly Valerium, uh, 940 Blackstock Avenue. If you can't figure out exactly where it is, used to, I mean, it, people just piled up there on the weekends. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that was actually the <clears throat> nexus of uh, the band I was in, mm-hmm. Signs of Life. Like mm-hmm. we all kind of met based on the origins of that place and, you know, I Base played banana for those that know. For, yes, former for <laughs> the, the stomping <laughs> hollowed grounds of Base Banana, aka Casey Bishop, aka also one of the founders and former host of Beacon House Podcast. This is a big one, and and I want to say this too: like, if you're one of the people that's got the Burn the City shirt, please wear it. Please show up in your Burn the City gear. Like, there's that thing, and if, I forget what fucking movie it was a long time ago, and it was there was a scene where a guy was chastising another college guy about, and he was, he was saying things like, Hey man, are you wearing the shirt of the band you're going to see? Don't be that guy. No, and be it, that guy. Fucking be that guy. Like, yeah, like a hundred percent be that guy. All bands want to see your support. And I love it when there's just like a whole bunch of people wearing the shirt and it just shows like an allegiance and just, you know, if, if your burn the city shirt is clean, please fucking wear it. Like it, it really gives us a boost on stage. And, um, if you have anything, it's a strange color, so please don't feel any pressure, but if anyone out there listening has anything resembling yellow accents that they're happy with, bring that with you too. We're, we're starting to okay. do a little bit of, a little bit of visual story. We're going to give you, okay, this may be the, this may be the first 
crack in this egg that we share with anyone. How much trouble are we going to get in with the rest of the guys? I uh, will see. Whatever. <laughs> it's going to be air. It'll be on Spotify by the time they hear it. That's right. Um, so we do have some new things kind of thematically. Like everybody, if, you, if you've been following Burn the City, you remember like the last album <clears> was <throat> Stars and Final Lie, and it was kind of like a space odyssey, mm-hmm. um, but, it was, but it was very allegorical to like other things, and like it's just real, real beautiful. And there, there was, and it did kind of have like a, Kind of a color scheme. There's a lot of blues and things yeah, going on. There's like a lot of reds and blues. And uh, we have been working on a new project, and it is also a thematic, mm-hmm. uh, kind of a love uh, Hollywood horror story kind of. That's a decent description. Yeah. Maybe you could kind of say, and um, and there's a big theme of the color yellow mm-hmm. in this one. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you you take it away and just sort of talk about possibly why that is, or if I don't, you know, any, anything you feel like you can, well, let's go ahead and say this. Uh, if you come to the show on April 12th, next Friday at Asylum 801 at 940 Blackstock Avenue at exactly 7 30 PM, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to hear some of your favorite burn the city songs, but also two new tracks mm-hmm. from the upcoming album. Mm-hmm. And, um, Hunter's going to tell you a little bit about those now. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get too in depth yet because we're not there. Also, we don't know what the fuck we're doing. Like, we, this but, may all change. Like, once we get, like, we're like, well, it's going to be like this and it's going to be about that. And it's going to sound like this. But as soon as we true. get it on the recording console, Randy's just going to go, nope, change it all. <laughs> it sucks. You know? Sounds yeah, like I may have made by, a, Sounds like it was played by Octopus or something. I may have made a, a, a mortal mistake in telling you guys I was going to pursue the same writing avenue because if anyone remembers, because I know we talked about this too, I didn't tell the band that it was a uh, quote unquote concept record until like halfway through recording stars and final lie. <laughs> and then they were like, dude, what? And I was like, it's too late. I'm sorry. Wait, the songs are done, but, <laughs> but I loved it. I love, and that's how we got our comic book. No one seems upset. The by graphic it. novel, like, yeah. like, it came <clears throat> from that. And so like, I'm proud of it. I'm proud that there's like a little story in the album, you know, like, so in the, in the vein that um, stars and final lie was trying to do like a sci-fi, end of the world and then going out into space to find something new love story with different allegorical elements. The new one is going to do something similar, but I wanted to as much as possible kind of invert that and stay very more, more cosmic horror as opposed to cosmos itself, incorporating elements of the broader Cthulhu mythos. So no one get excited. Cthulhu's not showing up in the record, but broader elements of it, things that predate it, things that it has influenced as well. And a lot of that comes from a desire to explore and comment on the things that I find tragic about modern uh, Western civilization. But to the Hollywood horror story, like a lot of that is kind of looking back at the, uh, the idea is looking back at the uh, the glitz and glam that attracts people, attracted people still does, and the things people will do to get it, and the dangers in making that the very thing that you're pursuing as opposed to something uh, that's actually outside of yourself. So, and and just <clears throat> let me just say, sure. I absolutely I love that as a theme. Uh, the idea that that and you've heard this repeated like all throughout. Uh, uh, you know, culture and just basically like if you, if you pursue the, like if you pursue the, the vanity, if you pursue the glamour, if you pursue like the ulterior things, like you get none of it, Mm -hmm. none of it, you get nothing. And, and, but if you pursue like the right thing, Mm -hmm. if you like strive for what, if you try to just do the right thing and you're not worried about the, the fame and the, the, the stuff that comes along with it, then generally you get it all thrown in. A thing that I want to do is touch on these things, but not get so pointed that, um, not to disparage a whole genre, but that it becomes a country song, like where the song is only the thing that it is at the, I don't like that. I don't like that and stuff that I listen to for the most part, it has its place, but I wanted to touch on some of the social aspects that can pressure somebody into that position. Even that, even that Nickelodeon documentary, you know, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Again, just falls right in line with all this, like all this stuff you find out, and I mean, it's just. So this this is along along those lines, and and uh, I think it's going to be very exciting. Yeah, we're we're very excited about it, and again, there's there's some stuff that we're slowly going to start creeping into the um, live performances to 
to kind of point that direction and really drive home this is what we're doing. Um, that said, speaking of sunken worlds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a great segue. Okay, well, that, that's it for, that's it for Band Eat Band. Uh, please come out on uh, April 12th, Friday. It's a Friday. A lot, of, a lot of you guys have been like, look, we want to come see you, but we can't come out on a Thursday or a Wednesday. Okay, here you go. Friday night, and it's early. I think we're going on at 7.30. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the whole thing's going to be over by 11. So look, what do you got to lose? You could even just come see us and then go out after that. Yeah. Whatever you want to do, man. Or, I mean, look, let's go ahead and wrap up all this, all this band talk and get into the real reason for the season. This episode, the Godzilla King Kong movie. Is it, what is it? The New Kingdom? Is it called New Kingdom? Uh, no, Godzilla it's Kong. Godzilla Kong, the new empire. The new empire. Not to be confused with Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire, or Planet or Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. The Kingdom of the Empire of Godzilla and Kong. Yeah, that's right. The Frozen Apes. Part two. Son of King Kong and Godzilla's yeah. empire of the Frozen <laughs> Apes of the Planet of uh, I was tickled to death when we talked about it. Just real quick, guys, to, to drive the idea of what this movie is, let's just get out in front of it. We were talking about it at band practice. Our genius friend Dylan doesn't want to see it, and he has his own reasons. But we were, because we were smart. like, we said, "What do you think the movie is?" And he just blurted something out in ten seconds, and I was like, "Well, you know, that's actually very accurate." So. And look, as as the previews for this movie started to bubble up, uh, you know, late in twenty twenty three, we were giving Hunter a lot of shit because it just looked like okay, so like. Awful is what it looked like. Well, Go ahead. Well, and even even in the Americanized, like super commercial string of movies, the re reboots or mm-hmm. the re re reboots or whatever you want to call it, like it had still at least acknowledged that like Godzilla and King Kong were these two separate titans mm-hmm. and kind of like these opposing forces, and and they had they finally clashed and it was kind of scary, mm-hmm. and then like they didn't kill each other, so they got to coexist. But like now, in the trailers, they're like running together like full on running bay watch yeah like i'm yeah. pretty sure king kong had a little red bathing suit on <laughs> and fucking godzilla grew arms i'm i'm convinced just so that he could run yeah with running arms on the beat and it just looked really dumb and uh but again i understand this is not like an art movie i get that so so we we used it to kind of tease Hunter, but honestly, as it got closer and closer and closer, the previews did look pretty good. It looked really exciting, and um, <laughs> we just went and actually went with Grace. Like spoiler, Grace was supposed to be here originally. She couldn't be here. She had a family emergency, and we hope everything's going well. Grace really did like the movie a lot, and she went back and watched a bunch of the other Godzilla movies just to prepare. So Grace, uh, you're out there with us in spirit. And we hope that you you get something out of this podcast. Hunter is going to divulge all the secrets of Godzilla here. When we revisit Godzilla at whatever point in the future, because we will, I'm desperate to have Grace on the other side of the table with whatever notes she has from the franchise at large. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, So, so anyway, like, like just to kind of like, just to paint with broad strokes real quick. Yeah, tackle this like a monkey going through a pyramid. I liked it. I liked it. There, it wasn't perfect, and a lot of it was was extreme cheese. Mm-hmm. But but all in all, it was self aware. That's the thing it did right. Yeah, and it entertained the absolute <clears throat> shit out of me. It was mm-hmm. big and fun, and easily the most epic thing I've ever seen. Yeah, uh, just in terms of scale, like there was so much big things happening. Like it was just overwhelmingly bombastic. Yeah, Dylan actually asked based on the previews. He said, "Isn't this like following?" To use a, he said to use a Marvel like comparison following the trajectory of the franchise isn't this one like Age of Ultron and that's a that was an okay comparison but then upon thinking about it this is where we settled um, at band practice I was like it's actually Thor Ragnarok because Age of Ultron it's not boring but it is completely vapid Thor Ragnarok is equally vapid but it is enthrallingly entertaining yeah yeah it's a good ride yeah it's good dumb fun i have never rewatched age of ultron and i probably never will thor ragnarok i would never turn off turn off if i was anywhere and it was on yeah and you know i brilliant fun i feel the same i haven't thought about it to that extent but i feel the same way i've never gone back to watch age of ultron but if you see ragnarok on it's a good time yeah 
it's big fun and it's a good time and it's lighthearted and it takes, it's light. It takes itself light. Um, so look, so I, I have the same perspective of the Godzilla movie, the, the new one as your average movie goer, like mm-hmm. somebody that sees it on the, like the tonight show and they go, Oh, that looks like a lot of fun. And you just wind up going to see it with a couple of friends or your kids or whatever. But you have a very different, a very unique perspective on this entire franchise. Hope. Yeah. So before we get into, I, I, I want to ask you a lot of questions about like how it fits with all the other movies and the TV sure. show and blah, blah, blah. But before we do that, just go ahead and tell me, tell me how you felt about the Godzilla movie, the new well, empire. Well, so I was thrilled to have loved it. I truly loved it. Um, if you remember, I was actually very trepidatious about this movie when that first preview came out and all the hell you guys gave me was, deserved but i was it hurt sure more because i felt it we didn't help by being dicks about it yeah. <laughs> right but that's what made it hurt because i was like i can't really defend this right now why does he look like that why are they running together yeah like, it's so stupid um the thing that the movie did really well was it established its own context in which that stuff worked worked being the key word it doesn't make sense most of it doesn't make sense but yeah so honestly on the level, I've, I've been saying this for a few years, and I think, honestly, King of the Monsters really established this for me because of the amount of defending I had to do for it and still do to this day. It's the worst performer in the MonsterVerse. No fault of its own. 2019 was the most packed and successful summer season ever in Hollywood. Remember, guys, this movie released like two weeks before or after Endgame. It had no sh- chance at oh, all. Oh, yeah. Um, anyways. Anyways. Um, in defending king of the monsters which i unabashedly love while acknowledging its flaws it really kind of consolidated because when we came out of the theater with king of the monsters i remember you looked at me and you had a big smile so i don't think you hated it like you enjoyed yourself i remember enjoying it but you were like you also said i don't know man that was kind of dumb in some spots and i I was like (laughs) i was like yeah but it reminded me of the way that i played godzilla when i was a kid having my G.I. Joes and everything and Cobra and all that stuff on one side of the carpet and on the other side of the carpet, like little Lego cities and my Godzilla monsters. Fuck and I was yes. just cutting back and forth between the melodrama yes. of the people. But the people were like sci-fi badasses. And then on the other side, you know, Snake Eyes was screaming for help, but he's mute so no one could hear him. And he was inside a Gundam getting his ass kicked by Godzilla the whole time, you know, like. Yeah, which is perfect. Yeah, so on that level it works. Also, I don't, and it, I don't know exactly what I said when we came out of that movie. And I, it's, there's probably an episode. I know there's definitely an episode of Beacon House where we all mm-hmm. talk about it. Um, but without having to revisit that, I would like to acknowledge, like, I probably was not thinking. Well, I mean, you have to acknowledge what movie you bought the ticket for. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah I didn't think I was going to see the fucking English patient and then wound up watching Godzilla. <laughs> like, I went to see a Godzilla movie. You, you know what I mean? There's you do not seem one bit disappointed in your... There's only so fair. many. Yeah. There's only so many fucking ways a Godzilla movie can zig or zag. I mean, he's going to smash a town. He's going to swim a little. He's going to breathe fire. The things are going to blow up. I mean, like I don't know what you're going for. Yeah. So, so you know, you have to let's establish a ground, a framework here. So the the thing that I look for in entertainment, just which is what defending King of the Monsters established for me, and it's been concrete and it's been true my whole life. Getting back to this new one, which is why we're here. Um. At the base level, what I want from you is to tell me the dumbest, most bombastic, stupid, like, just without logic, sci-fi slash fantasy adventure story you can tell me, but tell it to me with the earnestness of The Godfather. Like, I want you to believe it like there's a horse's head in your bed. (laughs) You know, it's... That's what I want for my entertainment. Um, then if you can add depth and everything else, I, of course, love that. And I, I even prefer that. And that's kind of what Godzilla Minus One did since you brought that up. Like, that movie, Godzilla was genuinely scary without overselling it because the movie's not. But Godzilla, in parts, is scary. The movie's heartbreaking. It's also uplifting. You're incredibly engaged with the human characters. The kaiju stuff, when it happens, is amazing. It's thrilling. It's really exciting. It looks great. All of that stuff. This movie is all of that minus the part where the human story was very engaging. Well, and I was going to say, so for, for just for people that didn't catch that one or they didn't, th- that's not on their radar because again, it's not on all the tel- the talk shows. It's not right. like, like I saw. So let me, let me cycle back a little bit. So like one of my favorite actresses is Rebecca Hall. She's fantastic. Who, who plays <clears throat> like the main, 
the, the expositional character in the Godzilla. Like, Who we can't remember the name of two movies in. Look, like <laughs> I saw a review of this movie where they were talking about, they go, well, they did it again, where basically they have this human cast and the human cast just exists to narrate the story of what the monsters are doing. Yeah. Well, Godzilla is going into the water because that's where the energy is. Or Like they basically yeah. just guide you through... And they're just like this, the the talking heads for the plot. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they said they they improved on that a little in this one. They did, and um, but that's usually her role in these. But anyway, anyway <clears throat> I saw like after I went and saw the movie, I was like really into it, and like I sort of like I, I googled a lot, I watched like, YouTube videos on it, and so she was being interviewed not on just the normal talk shows like Fallon and Kimmel. Mm-hmm. She was on Kelly Clarkson talking about Godzilla. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean this one obviously had way higher visibility than minus one, but mm-hmm. minus one did come out. Just recently. December. Okay. Yeah. Can you kind of tell the, the the listeners sort of what that movie is about and the significance of it? And does it relate to this one at all? Yeah, that's fair. So Minus One does not relate at all. It's, it's completely self-isolated, um, which is a redundant statement. Anyways, Godzilla Minus One is 1947. Um, it's post-war Japan, and it's it's about a small group of people, a found family establishing itself in the ruins of World War II and the American occupation, which is a background element. It's like mentioned twice. And what the human spirit has to do to overcome such odds in general, and then what the human spirit has to do to overcome such odds if an apocalyptic devil monster comes out of the ocean and starts stepping on everything. And that's kind of what, made it important it was it was the fact that they went back to an era that we've never seen with godzilla so the franchise was new in that capacity but everyone like forever in a day it's always been like the original is a classic and then people will go shin godzilla is great if they've seen it and then the rest of them are just like the gifts you see on text messages where he's flashing a peace sign and drop kicking fools it's like Godzilla as or a like franchise is choking, far more diverse than that. that thing with the tree. That, that's, King Kong? Is it you mean, King Kong? That's King Kong, yeah. yeah. That thing? That's How could you? I couldn't remember what was that. <laughs> I just remember him ch- with it. Anyway. But that's what my love of the franchise comes from, is the fact that it that it is all of those things. And it's very rare that we get a minus one, to be fair. And I side with Dylan. Like, I would prefer... Honestly, I would prefer almost all of them to be more minus one than the other. But that's because we've got a sickness, so it's it's okay, right? But yeah, ultimately, yeah. Godzilla is a giant dinosaur that breathes blue fire. And like you need to know what you signed up for. Like the, you said. the Godzilla minus one movie chronologically, where does doesn't it occur before the first Godzilla movie? Yeah, if if there's any continuity at all, it would be that it took it takes place before the first one, and then you could argue somehow that the first one happens in succession, but that would be it. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. You have to do a lot of arguing. So, for that, would, would you, was it fair to say Godzilla minus one is a prequel? I think that's a stretch. Got it. It's a it's a it's a good way to look at it. I was doing some of that math in my head. Just if you need the to map time. it out, but I, yeah. I, I guess a, a probably good way to observe these movies is not to need them to necessarily fit together in a timeline. Like to just observe them for what they are. They have the loosest continuity. That's a really good point. Um, including the one whose shirt I'm wearing. But that that series, the Heisei era from '84 to '95, has the tightest continuity of any of them, and it still makes no sense. So. Well, that's fair. So okay, <clears throat> going there then. How does the the Monarch TV show fit into? Is, is I, I was it was my understanding that it was going to sort of bridge the King of the Monsters to this new Kong and Godzilla movie kind of thing. But that's what I thought too. So what, um, how far did you get? Because I know you said I got, you didn't I got like it. I got like three episodes in, and I was like, "There's just not enough." That part's true. There's just not enough fighting and mon- there's just so much weird story, and I, it just didn't do a lot for me. So. The thing that's strange about Monarch is if you look at the credits, the executive producers and like the writing room have nothing to do with um, Godzilla vs. Kong or Godzilla X Kong minus Mike Doherty who wrote and directed King of the Monsters. So really Monarch is kind of like trying to find a way to bridge the gap between 2014 and how insane things got with King of the Monsters. And there's plenty of story to tell there. The big problem with Monarch, to your point of not being able to watch it, is like the monster stuff when it happens was fun, but it was like three minutes an episode. And it's Apple TV, so it's like maybe do three episodes less in 10 minutes an episode or something. But it was the human story was engaging and then became asinine and slasher movie-esque the further it went. 
it established itself. There was some drama, like the the missing father. The father is connected to Monarch. What's going on? Why and is he and here? I do remember that stuff. All that stuff. That stuff was really engaging. But then, literally, just the further the series went, just to prevent you from wasting your time, because I do love it. I do love it. I thought it was very good for a Godzilla TV show. Yeah. <laughs> that cap- caveat matters. The further the series goes on, minus like the last episode or something, it mostly turns into Kurt Russell's awesome. And every time Kurt Russell's on screen, you love it. His character story was great the whole time. But every other character thing, they were just there to exposit or they were there to have weird love triangles with a sister, an ex-girlfriend, and a brother. Does Godzilla actually show up in the TV show Monarch? A few times. Okay, okay. And they're genuinely good times when he shows up, but it's very rare. And is it the same Godzilla from these current movies that we, you know... It, it is, okay, yeah. Okay, so... Um, so this is a on the on the note of continuity. Like one thing that's really frustrating with the MonsterVerse is, as a franchise, a, a cinematic universe, quote unquote, it worked better than DC and almost anything else that's tried that, other than Marvel. But it's not because there's actually a story happening. Like every single movie is isolated. Godzilla versus Kong, I thought would have the most continuity with this current one because it's the same director and like writing team and all that. You don't need to see that previous movie to have any idea what's happening in this one either. And on that level, that's probably a good thing. Honestly, it made $200 million opening weekend, which is insane. So that's really good for it. So to, to be fair about that, but at the same time, it's like these, these movies and now this TV show are moving in and out of each other with an established continuity that nobody is paying attention to that's making the stuff. So if you watch it, a, a good point. The design changed a lot between the first movie and the second movie. Mostly it was because the director wanted to, fine. But they were like, there's story reasons for it. Never come up in the second movie. And then in Monarch, they're like, since we're in that gap and we're bridging it, we're going to tell you how. They don't. Godzilla just gets <laughs> in a fight Damn it. and then goes to sleep and he wakes up and he looks different. I'm like, that's... You can infer that that's like maybe scar tissue or he evolved or something, but you're asking people to do way too much work. Like that's not, I get it. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of problems with, so with to, the larger franchise. Well, and but. to sort of, so, so in, in essence, it would say to assume that a person does not have to have watched the Monarch show no. to appreciate the new Godzilla movie that we went to see. Correct. Not at all. Godzilla Kong, the new empire. Honestly, I think spoilers. I think the, the only thing, that seeing any of the previous entries would help is seeing King of the Monsters to understand what Mothra is. Cause right. Mothra returned and that was thrilling as a fan. Um, yeah. We, going forward, there are going to be spoilers. So everybody, yeah. just, if, if you care, then stop and go watch it. If not, then just come along for the ride. I saw a thing that said sure. it, <clears throat> that one of the big reveals, which may not even be a reveal, but in the new movie, mm-hmm. they sort of uh, crystallized, that the three protectors of this entire realm were now definitely unequivocally Godzilla, Kong, and Mothra. Godzilla being the protector of the flora and fauna or the earth, as it Mm -hmm. were. Kong, the protector of humanity, and Mothra, the protector of Middle Earth. Is that, do you jive with that? Or is that just some reporter kind of... It's the, it's the latter, but I mean, I think you can, you can easily infer that there's a lot that you can infer, but again, the movie is so inoffensive to its credit that it doesn't even really establish rules like that, but that, that is kind of, they hinted that, but it, where the, where the borders are between powers and principalities and stuff is not right. established. It's just, those are the three good guy kaiju. You can always trust them is what, kind of the idea. Get, knock out a couple uh, things that you loved about the new movie. Well, the return of Mothra, um, I'll be brief because a lot of how that happened, I didn't love, but her coming back and the way she was used after she was back, I adored. Also the fact that she didn't die. I can't tell you how rare that is in a movie with Mothra in it. Normally her thing is to die. Okay. Okay. So her just living alone. She's the Sam Elliott of Godzilla Yeah. Yeah. Libby and I were like, best Godzilla movie ever. Mothra lived. (laughs) Um, that honestly, the, the uh, the King Louis Kaiju Scar King he was a lot of fun I didn't find him effective as like a bad guy but he was a lot of fun like the personality involved like when he shows up and he's got the slouch shoulder and he's a dick to Kong the whole time and you can read the facial expressions but that's a that's the thing the Kaiju story the fact that it branched off the way it did and without subtitles or anything dumb you could 
easily tell what was happening. And while the story wasn't complex, the emotions of the monsters were, that was amazing. Like half of the movie is monsters and half of the monster stuff is just monsters emoting and relating to other monsters yeah, and it's you, not boring. I think that's what the, the article meant when I, uh, I read the article talking about how they managed to improve the whole, like there's gotta mm-hmm. be a human right over there on that rock explaining everything that's happening mm-hmm. because the monsters can't talk <clears throat> and that, you know what I mean? They have to go, Oh look, Godzilla's found another enemy and he's probably behind that rock over there. And that's why everybody's running over here and blah, blah. like, it's almost like you have a narrator, yeah. you know, but now that they did find a way to sort of tell the story through, through, visual imagery and emoting and the, the body language of the characters and stuff. So yeah, I had no problem understanding what was going on. Um, even without there being the, the canned dialogue, you know, like, and that um, was thrilling. That was really cool. I also thought it was really cool that there was like the, the, I thought the big bad was going to be that, that monkey, mm-hmm. uh, uh, scar King. Right. Yeah. And then, and I was like, Ooh, and it was like, well, wait a minute. It's not too threatening. Kong's still a lot bigger than him. Mm-hmm. Like it's, I mean, he's got a lot of, a lot of help, but I think Kong can take him. And then wait a minute. The then ice dragon. They're yeah. like, Oh, this fucking thing comes out of the wall. And I was like, Oh shit. That thing's it's really so big. big. Yeah. It's so big. Yeah. And they even said like, Oh, the last time this thing was seen, it created the ice age. Yeah. You know, like what, what the fuck? And then I was like, then I was like, okay, now I'm worried even with Godzilla, what are they going to do with this thing? You know? So it was like, it was very exciting. I think it, it, they established like a something, they established a hill to climb, so to speak. You know, I don't remember who it was, but somebody asked me when they found out I saw the movie, um, my friend Cameron, that's who it was. He said, how are the bad guys? He was like, do you actually like worry or is it, eh? that was the thing I told him. I was like, Scar King is awesome. He's not actually threatening, in my opinion. Shimo, which is the ice dragon, genuinely, there were a couple spots where I was like, Mothra's going to eat it, probably. And then I was also like, are you going to kill Godzilla? I know, I know, I I know. I I thought that, too. Like, Like, uh, yeah, because it it fucked Kong's hand up. Really bad. Really bad. And and then there was a scene a little bit later where just Godzilla gets totally covered in ice. Yeah. And I was like, is this going to be it? Like, are they going to actually kill off Godzilla? And then, and then Godzilla, like, coming back as, you know, the linebacker version with the, the pink spikes and everything. Yeah. That was his super powered up version, and he only did the same stuff he did. That's a gripe. But anyways, in that last fight, when he's fighting Shimo, there were a few spots where, like, the size difference is so large that Godzilla kind of grappling Shimo through a building the way he did looked amazing. And I was like, Shimo likes you, dude. That's the only reason that happened. Like... Yeah. Shimo could have just planted her front feet and you would have just smacked into her and fallen backwards. Like, yeah. The, I mean, it was so epic. In fact, one of the things great, and I'll, I'll like, since she's not here to talk about it with me, one of the things Grace and I got really tickled about after the movie, it was just like, I mean, it's great that, that these things are here on the planet to like defend humanity, mm-hmm. like, but it'd be nice if every time one of them like woke up, it didn't just destroy 15 bridges and right, not, right, right, right. like the destruction that happens just <laughs> when these things go to the fucking bathroom, mm-hmm. you know, like Godzilla sleeps in the Roman Coliseum. There's actually some stuff about that, which, and when he wakes up, like what, like you can't have a apartment building in that city. He's just going to walk over it. When he gets up the first time and he starts walking in the movie, I've, I've been on record with you guys in Beacon House before about how much I hate talking. I could not help myself. I looked over at Libby as he like crumbled part of it. And I was like, he's so fat. He can't lift his foot up any higher. Like he tried, (laughs) he tried, um, just the amount of destruction in every scene. Like, like when Kong comes up out of the water or whatever, like when Godzilla is just moving across the city or like, it's just, well, actually to that, to that point though, on the level, on the level of describe- the fucking pyramids, the, it the f- pyramids. Yeah, Godzilla does not like those pyramids. I dude. mean, like, just it, it's so over the top. It's just crazy on, how much stuff gets decimated while they're just doing their thing. With character development and the the monster motivations, it's some of the stuff that was really cool. Like Libby, in one of the early scenes when Godzilla's walking away, is walking through a water canal, and Libby looked at me and she goes that's the least amount of destruction he could cause leaving. Like he's actually trying to not yeah. step on things. I was like, that's a good point. Cause as soon as like, and I remember that scene, something else shows up <laughs> like that to your point though, like Godzilla being the, the somewhat protector of the, the surface world kind of thing. He's not doing a great job. Cause like Scylla, which is the big spider thing at the yeah. beginning. Yeah. 
I know it was like killing a bunch of people and everything, but it also like those legs were still spindly. Like they were giant legs, but you know, like every time it stepped somewhere, it was like, it was like a manhole covers worth of destruction. Yeah. And then Godzilla like bulldozed 12 city blocks getting to it to kill it. (laughs) He's like, these are my people, leave them alone. It's like, there's no people left, dude. And I, (laughs) and, and listen to, 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 to play like, you know, to be fair, if you, if imagine if they wrote and tried to direct a movie where, the fucking kaijus come up out of the ocean and then they carefully try to dainty and they delicate, carefully yeah. step around the buildings and try to fight without <laughs> knocking over the gas station or whatever. Like it would be so stupid. Yeah. No, like, it would. It's not like, what you go for. They have to wreck humanity in order to save humanity. And like and there's probably a metaphor in there somewhere too. It's just it's insane how like there's people just running screaming because there's a mean one and then they're running screaming because there's a good one. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter. If these things show up, you're just you're fucking dead. You're gonna be a pancake. Yeah. It just, but you know, which also is kind of fun too. But that was one of the things Grace and I got really tickled over. It's just like how much shit they break mm-hmm. in the in the process of of trying to save everything. Um, uh, let me think. What uh, thoughts? Okay, thoughts on. The, well, you said you liked Mothra already. Oh, what about the Kong storyline? Where where were you at? Where were you at on that? I actually quite quite enjoyed that a lot of what the movie does is like over telegraph which is fine because again to its credit i think it's simple and unpretentious on purpose which great um i did see some people interpreting like biblical allusions into the kong story and that's one of the things i wanted to discuss as the monsterverse franchise at large as a comparison note because i'm bringing it back to episode one i'm not here to yuck your yum zing but that's not present in this. Um, I think it's cool that you can infer like that. 194 <laughs> episodes later. Yeah. Still not yet when you're young. Um, cause they were like, it, it, it's an illusion of the story of Moses and all these other things. Cause he's like away from his home and then he finds his way back and then he has to assert power over a slave owning King or Pharaoh or everything. And that, that stuff is present if you choose to see it. So that's fine. But the point that I wanted to make is like one of the things that I, didn't like about this current movie but to its credit is partly probably why people dig it because it's such popcorn fun is king of the monsters did go there with a lot of stuff a lot of regardless of what you think of the movie their story it's undeniable that the kaiju themselves were treated um like gods and they were treated with religious reverence and iconography and allusions to things like that. Yeah. And it was established in the lore and some of it was hokey cause they were very on the nose about how they did it. Excuse me. But in going there, it really established the power and, and fear and majesty of these things. And then in the new ones, they're like, yeah, they're big and they hit stuff, which is okay. Right. But to that, to that point that said all, all my disparaging, like there's not anything that deep on the metaphorical level. I was actually really excited as, as a, I've been a huge King Kong fan my whole life too. If you guys don't know this, Hunter just likes giant monsters. That's the secret. Started with Godzilla, but. <laughs> we'll wait for you guys to, to pause from gasping. <laughs> Catch your breath. But getting, one of the things that was really thrilling was seeing Kong reunite with his own species just as a longtime fan of that character. Because his story has always been that he's a loner. And there's elements of the story that is kind of fractured even by him not being alone anymore. It's much like Superman in that regard. Once Superman's entire family shows up, you're like, well, you're not really the last Kryptonian anymore. Like, stop whining about it. But that said, there was something really cool about this lonely ape that almost always dies at the end of his movies, surviving three movies into a franchise. And not only that, but in the third one, finding a new family and being able to save them and himself and find a new domain where he can have a home and like all these things that I'm sure most people don't care about, but just as a weirdo that really loves the monsters and sees their characters as established, like seeing Kong get to go, it was so, it was so stupid because the movie was so bombastic that it was like a couple of the moments to the, to the credit of its simplicity, the few moments at once to hit, Should be able to, but there's so much bombast, I just wasn't able to fully invest. But that moment when Kong, right after he's injured and, like, Shimo crippled him and all that, he shows up and he sees uh, Gia, the little girl. Um, When he signs, I lost, I think he says, I lost home or something like that. Even though 
like didn't make me roll tears in certain movies it may have that's heartbreaking and the fact that that can be established is great because he's like all he's wanted through the whole franchise and the history of the character is to not be alone that's why he always chases Anne to the top of the empire state building and tries to protect her he's got this thing that isn't afraid of him anymore and now he's dead and blah 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 um, well, I've never heard it articulated that well. But that, then he finds his home. That is and loses absolutely <clears throat> the the appeal to the Kong movies. It's not just to see a giant monkey on a building. It, it's the idea of the like how loneliness and like mm-hmm. the disparagement. Yeah, yeah, you're right. To to embarrass you on the 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 grandest scale possible for being my friend for all these years. In anticipation of the movie, he's shaking his head already. For those of you that can't see, fucking great. Just buckle up, buddy. In anticipation of the movie, I was looking up um, 2005 Peter Jackson King Kong stuff, which is still my favorite Kong movie. It is too long. I love it. But I was I was wondering to myself on that note of like context around a story. I thought is a, is a is a poignant moment really as poignant as you think it is without the broader movie around it. So I looked up the scene where he climbs the Empire State Building at the end on YouTube, and not the death, but in that movie, the part where he's holding Anne and looks out at the sunset and uses sign language to communicate the word beautiful and then looks at her after she agrees and then signs again, beautiful. And I rolled tears in the middle of my wife's coffee shop. I was like, someone save this monkey. (laughs) Someone save this monkey, please. God. And then in this movie, he found a family. Speaking of family, because we need to talk about this just because everyone's so tickled by it. Spoilers again. The Little Monkey, Diddy Kong, as Dylan calls it. That's what I call it, too. Um, whose proper name is Suko, but Diddy Kong from now on. The fact that Kong got sick of him and picked him up and used him as a weapon. Kong picked up this baby monkey and used it as a battering ram against other Kong species in one of the fight scenes. Like using him like a baseball bat to hit other ones in the face and nunchucks and then throwing him. That's right. It was hilarious. That was a high point for me <laughs> because so I good. generally considered the little monkey pretty stupid. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I just don't, I, I get maybe trying to, to <clears throat> maybe trying to create some sort of a family mm-hmm. aspect around Kong so that the pay, the big payoff at the end, yeah, when he's yeah, no yeah. longer alone. I, I, I get it's one of the elements, but just as a character, maybe it was just the expressions the thing always had just made me furious. And it actually looks a lot like my baby cat, so I was I well, was on board with then it. You've got, it behaves the same way. You've but. got a better reference than I do, but <laughs> I just didn't think it really added much to the story. And um, I don't know. I wasn't a big fan of the, the little monkey, Diddy Kong, or Suko, or whatever. But um, what? So that that to me was one of the weak points. Sure. Also, the glove. So where you had on that glove? Like the um, way they explain it, like, look, look, when they go, when Rebecca Hall goes, mm-hmm. well, before, you know, this, we were working on some augmentation and the technology still exists. Like, like I was like, okay, what's she about to reveal? What's she, and then that guy goes and the Thanos gauntlet, the fucking Thanos gauntlet. <laughs> and like, and he flies it there with a the helicopter. Like it's in this bombed out base, but somehow he knows where to find it. And he goes and it gets it. And then just, and then attaches it to this giant, kaiju size monkey with a helicopter he just drops it on him and it just magically it fit perfectly yeah and 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 just the scene where he's like holding the fist up in the air like just that whole little segment of the movie was tough for me no agreed that was some of the weakest stuff i do for, go ahead Sorry. well mechanically i see why they did it because at sure. this point they're introducing things like well godzilla has been powering up the whole fucking movie which i want to say to me, that was my favorite part. This is what Godzilla mm-hmm. just kept going to the nuclear energy and just getting more and more powerful all movie long until he finally struck. Like I was, I was really like, that what? stuff was great. He's yeah. going to kick ass. Like I was fired up to see what he was going to do. He did a pretty good job. Did too. a good job. <laughs> and um, but but this point with the shit that's in like the Middle Earth Hollow. What do they call it? Is it Middle Earth Hollow Earth? Hollow Earth. Hollow Earth. Sorry, Hollow sorry, Earth. sorry. It was Lord of the Rings. My brother there. calls it Middle Earth too. So you can. But but the things that they were introducing down there, plus this super super overpowered Godzilla mm-hmm. Kong, was definitely out of his league. Oh yeah. Until he got the the Thanos gauntlet. You know, like and look, I sitting here talking about it, it makes perfect sense. But watching it, I was like, yeah, you know, they put a glove on God's on fucking King Kong. So that was actually one of the weakest spots of the good stuff in the movie for me was that specifically in the in, in the gravity inversion fight. Those were two examples of the movie going further than I think anybody when this franchise started thought it was ever gonna go. 
Mm. And so I respect that. But then giving everything that was established in the movie, why didn't you go further? That gauntlet is there to power him up and help his arm, yes. But it's also because of the electrical properties of it alludes to the Toho version of Kong who actually just has electrical powers. Like he can just produce electricity and punch you with his electric fist, which is ridiculous. But they didn't do much with that, right? And then in the, in the um, inversion fight, it was awesome. So I'm not trying to knock it, but just if you were ever going to find a way to make that incredibly popular gif of Godzilla sliding on his tail to drop kick somebody happen, why didn't he drop kick the monkey or something? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like the movie goes to a bunch of places that are admittedly awesome. We both have established, we loved the movie. It was great. It was a lot of fun. But if you're already, you're already at the spot where you have four monsters that are the size of like skyscrapers floating in the middle of the air in a fist fight in the middle of a pocket universe in the middle of the planet earth. Why is Godzilla drop kicking something a step too far at this point? You know, <laughs> you that's make, just what I want to know. Cause you make a very strong point. Yeah. I don't know. Like uh, the, uh, the gravity inversion scene was a little confusing to me. I don't know how Grace felt about it. Um, but it was, I was sort of like, well, why wait? Why? I mean, I get that this is where they all meet and they were coming. Like I, it, it was the, 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 the immaculate conception of the, all the monsters fighting together, you know, yeah. like it was, but, um, and I, but I'm glad that that wasn't the finale. I'm glad yeah. that after that they came up and they like, Oh, I would have been pissed. Like Barbados or wherever the they were yeah. fucking fighting, you know, I was it was like, in Rio, I think, right? Uh, somewhere, but it was badass. Also, Mothra should have been present in that fight. She did I, a bunch of really cool stuff in the middle, right? But the fact that she didn't come up to help was lame. And that was yeah. probably just budgetary. <laughs> also, I feel like there's another little Easter egg that I think possibly I noticed, or may, maybe I'm just inventing this, or I was trying to sort of force this. What did you invent? So at the very, again, spoilers, but if you're this far, you fucking know it anyway. The, the, at the, the very end of when they destroyed Scar King, <clears throat> mm-hmm. you know, the shitty monkey. Yeah. Uh, and, and King Louie. King Louie. And he was, I believe, Kong or somebody was holding him up yep. and the the ice dragon business like shot him and froze the fuck out of him mm-hmm. and there was a scene where it showed like a close up of his face where he was trapped inside the ice mm-hmm. but he had like one eye moving it was around. unfrozen yeah it was unfrozen and it was darting mm-hmm. uh, 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 maniacally mm-hmm. right before he got busted into a million pieces you yep. know like so I feel like that might have been either it was either a rip off of or it was totally coincidental, or it was sort of an homage to the old Disney movie, which I recently sent you guys a clip of, The Black Hole. You might actually be right. Where in the very final scene of The Black Hole, like they've gone through The Black Hole, and all this crazy stuff happened, and the the crazy evil mad scientist somehow becomes combined with his henchman robot, Mm -hmm. and he winds up in hell. And the very last shot of the whole movie, this is a Disney movie. It really fucked a lot of kids up. Like yeah. a lot of people my age saw this when they were seven. And it's, it's the reason that we're still doing therapy. Yeah. <laughs> but at the very last scene of this, what we thought was kind of Disney's version of like Star Wars. No, it was complete, like fucking just total psychological destruction at the end. It's the most un-Disney thing I've ever seen from a Disney movie. Yeah, and the guy's it's, inside this robot, which, by the way, the robot isn't isn't like, uh, it's not a humanoid form. So he has to be just like smashed up inside it. Yep. And it's standing on this crazy hill with all this fire, and it's this, it, this, this maniacal orchestral score plays as the camera zooms out, and the, one of the last things you see is the guy's eye, which I love that, don't you? Um, well, I tell you what, we're kind of getting near our time. Sure. Um, I did have one other tiny story I wanted to bring up. Uh, it's related Uh-oh. to a monster attack. Oh, no. But is there anything else you would like to say about... I mean, I know we could go on and on and on, but... Sure. I guess to sum it up, because I feel like I've done more complaining than most people may have anticipated. <laughs> I love this movie. Um, unabashedly love it. There's just not much to defend <laughs> as far as depth. But its greatest strength is that they decided to do that from the get-go, so it's not a movie that's failing to do anything. It's it's succeeding in almost every capacity and of what they've made it for. And I would <laughs> say, in, in its defense, in a world of blockbuster movies like the Fast and Furious franchise, mm-hmm. like The Expendables... Why can't Godzilla like, do that? Like, like, I mean, there's plenty <laughs> of movies that are big and big and successful 
and they're admittedly look I, look if you love those franchises I'm not I'm not trying to yuck your yum as we say but those are pretty stupid yeah. and to me this Godzilla movie wasn't any uh more disappointing or less less uh legitimate than going to see fucking Vin Diesel or The Rock in something you know like like it's just, the same thing yeah except these are these characters to me are way more exciting yeah. than fucking Vin Diesel and The Rock and whoever you know like th- or Jason Momoa or what like like this is Godzilla and Kong, like the yeah. most exciting creatures you could ever watch on a big screen for two and a half hours or whatever. And like, just know what you're getting into. This is a roller coaster. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you go to sign up for a roller coaster at the amusement park, you're not expecting somebody to read poetry to you for the next three and a half fucking minutes. You know, you're expecting <laughs> to be whipped around and like completely sensory overload. And that's what you get with this movie. It's really fun. And I enjoyed the shit out of watching it. And there's yeah. just a lot there's just a lot there. And and some of it is a little cheese and some of it is a little painful. But you know what? Like, as you go on, I feel like those are important elements in any really exciting story. There's got to be a little bit of cheese to give it that blockbuster element. It's why people love Jaws and Raiders and all that stuff. Those movies that have stood the test of time that yeah. people hail as classics, they are classics, but a lot of, like, there's a lot of literary attribution that is given to them that is not deserved. You can say it's it's not inappropriate because art is art and that's what's great about it. You can um, dissect those things and there's a subconscious behind every creator. So that's not to say they're even absent, but you know, those movies aren't loved because of their deep metaphorical, allegorical, <laughs> yeah. religious, social commentary or something, exactly. right? They're loved because they're awesome. Yeah. And they're and, awesome because they're fun. Yeah. And, and I'm going to say, so if you had to, Suggest so. What if somebody's only seen like the big Americanized mm-hmm. Godzilla franchise? If you wanted to suggest, I'm guessing you're going to suggest minus one and Shin Godzilla. So of those, I would say like really depends on what you want. But if you want to get into the broader franchise, pick one of the two most recent Japanese ones. Pick an early uh, one from the '90s. So do either versus King Ghidorah or versus Biollante because those are both weird but serious. And then pick an outright silly one. Because all three of those are going to give you the entire spectrum of what the franchise does. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, you, yeah, you kind of get the full, uh, all, all the different faces of the Godzilla franchise. Yeah, he's he's honestly much like Batman in that way. And I, I won't belabor the point anymore, but just there's Adam West, there's Ben Affleck, the best, and there's also um, Christian Bale, right? And then everything in between. They're all Batman. And from, for our final monster story... Uh, I'm going to pause and I'm going to show Hunter a video and then we're going to come back. Can't wait. In fact, if all of you would like to watch the video along with this, I would like for you to Google or YouTube this phrase. Turkey Tom terrorizes school in North Carolina. Just go watch that and we'll come back in a minute. Okay, we're back. I don't know if anyone else Googled uh, Mr. Tom terrorizes school in North Carolina. (laughs) But we did. <laughs> so uh, the story is, and I just want to say, like the reason I brought this video up at the end of our monster podcast here is I saw this today on the TV at work, mm-hmm. like across the room, <laughs> and it showed the picture of this guy with an umbrella trying to fight this turkey. And I was like, "What? what's happening? And I paid attention to the story, and then I, I looked the video at myself. It basically... What happened is a very mean turkey who they now have named Turkey Tom. Mm. Turkey Tom has terrorized the uh, pickup lane of a school in North Carolina. And the principal came running out with an umbrella to fight the turkey. Mm -hmm. And then it it, it is if that's not bad enough. And the main picture you see is like the principal is like, look, I mean, what image did you get of the principal, Hunter? (laughs) (laughs) Just, I'm I'm not saying, look, I'm not just, he had a no comment. He just had an umbrella. It sounded like it looked like he was probably already carrying an umbrella. Yeah, and it just looked on like, a sunny day. <laughs> it looked like a scene out of Singing in the Rain. It's just hard to explain. But anyway, oh. um, but what's what's funnier about the video is the the local news station mm-hmm. took it and ran with it like <clears throat> it was a like it was a murder, mm-hmm. like a murder mystery, and they brought in like an expert to explain the the motivations of the ter- well. That turkey is just really aggressive, and they he, they did the right thing by breaking out that umbrella so you could make it seem as big as you want to get on the end. And like Rebecca Hall needs to be careful because that lady's gunning for her job in these movies. She is, 
parents. And fucking, and then they they interviewed other parents in the carpool lane. <laughs> I well, love that lady so much. Yeah. I think we just need to teach our kids to learn to live with wildlife when it's in their territory. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> And they go, well, the, the, like, there's just enough confusion to hopefully scare Mr. Tom away. But but once he realizes he's not afraid of people, he's going to come back to that carpool. And then there's another scene where you show, it shows like a police car and the turkey has, <laughs> the turkey's up in front of the police car. And they're, they're like, he was even pecking and scratching. Like, that's what fucking turkeys do. Yep. But they made a whole new story out of this fucking turkey. Mr. Tom, the turkey terrorizing. Tom, God bless you, by the way, if you're listening. <laughs> terrorizing the carpool lane and they brought police wildlife experts and the local news in all these people trying to chase him off with an umbrella that umbrella's not going to do anything if tom decides he's done with it <laughs> his, his little velociraptor claws are going to rip that umbrella up in the person behind it too these people should be afraid of tom tom the turkey's dangerous if you guys have seen jurassic park the first one you don't want that thing in your kitchen <laughs> It's bad. It's bad news. <laughs> For any of you that actually watched the video, it was nothing <laughs> like that. It was just a turkey standing near a police car. News must be slow in uh, North Carolina. I mean, was nobody flying a kite that they could report about? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, the principal was going to, but then the, uh, the wind took his umbrella towards the turkey and they had to so, justify that picture somehow. So funny that they're wasting airtime with this. I mean, anyway. Everybody, just rest easy. Godzilla's protecting... The Earth, Mothra's <laughs> protecting civilization everywhere. Kong's protecting people, and Tom the Turkey's protecting your kids. <sighs> Farewell from Beacon House. <laughs> oh my.